We now return to day nine of the House Waco hearings. During this panel, we'll hear testimony from Assistant Defense Secretary for Special... Ambassador Holmes, if you'd be willing to uh, take your seat at the table. We all set. The uh, Joint Oversight uh, Committee studying the Waco situation will now come to order. We're very happy to uh, welcome back uh, Ambassador H. Allen Holmes. Mr. Holmes currently serves as the Assistant Secretary for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict. In his current capacity, is responsible for the overall supervision, including oversight of policy and resources of the Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict Activities at the Department of Defense. Mr. Holmes previously served as a U.S. Ambassador to Portugal from 1982 to 1985. I know you appeared before us last week. Uh, we have some additional questions that we'd like to ask you, and we thank you for coming back. I understand that you have an opening statement. Okay, before you start, if you would, uh, it's customary to um, swear you in, so if you'd please stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give these subcommittees is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Let the record show that the answer is in the affirmative. Ambassador, please proceed with your statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here <clears throat> before you again uh, to help you and the American people understand fully the role of the Defense Department in supporting civil Excuse authorities. Excuse me one, one second. There's a, there's a, do, you, uh, do you have copies of a statement that you can pass out? Uh, I can. We can make okay. copies we can make uh, subsequently. Copies. All right. Thank you very much. Please proceed. <clears throat> I'm, he I'm here before you again to help you and the American people understand fully the role of the Defense Department in supporting civil authorities in general, and in particular, the support the Department gave, gave to the Federal Bureau of Investigation near Waco, Texas, in March and April 1993. As I explained during my testimony on July 20th, the Congress has vested the Secretary of Defense with several means of providing assistance to civilian authorities and law enforcement agencies. You will recall that during the session on the 20th, the focus was on the so-called drug nexus and the fact that certain types of the department's support may be available on a non-reimbursable basis. I noted at the time, though, that much of the day-to-day -day support that the department gives to federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies is provided pursuant to statutes that require agencies to reimburse the department for their use of our equipment and the services of our personnel. As is the case with many departments of the federal government, DOD has well-defined authority, for example, in Chapter 18 of Title 10 of the U.S. Code or under the Economy Act in Title 31 of the Code to provide support to other agencies on a reimbursable basis. On February 28, 1993, and during the weeks that followed, the Department received numerous requests for support from the Department of Justice, specifically from the FBI, for assistance at Waco. We responded to these requests by providing the equipment and expert advice pursuant to the Secretary's statutory authority. The support included two M1 Abrams tanks, five combat engineer vehicles, and 10 Bradley fighting vehicles that were operated by FBI personnel. While DOD personnel were present at Waco, they did not perform law enforcement functions. The support provided was totally consistent with our statutory authority and with the congressional intent that DOD's equipment be used in a manner that ensures its return to the Pentagon in a combat-ready status. We are still working on a response to the chairman's request for a list of the equipment provided by DOD to law enforcement, but I can give you the following general summary. As I mentioned, DOD support to the FBI included tanks, CEVs, and Bradleys. Additionally, we, we provided about 12 Humvees, 
helicopters for both observation and possible medical evacuation, and some heavy trucks. They were either loaned to the FBI under the Economy Act and operated by FBI personnel, or, in the case of standby medical equipment, offered with the understanding that DOD's costs would be reimbursed. Although DOD personnel provided maintenance and training with respect to those vehicles, no DOD personnel operated these vehicles as part of the FBI's law enforcement activities during this period, including on April 19th. In fact, the department was meticulous in advising the military personnel who provided support as to the legal limitations on that support. We also provided some specialized support. The FBI asked for and we provided certain specialized equipment. We provided special video equipment and prototype automated reconnaissance equipment, again, operated by FBI personnel to assist the FBI in its operations. Although throughout the period, as many as, as 10 DOD technicians, active military or civilians, advised the FBI on the installation, capabilities, or use of this equipment, no DOD personnel directly participated in any law enforcement operations involving the use of this equipment. In addition, from March 10 to 17, we provided equipment to interfere with television reception within the compound and we provided civilian personnel support to operate that equipment. The equipment was removed from Waco on March 18. Finally, at the FBI's request, recognizing the potential for injuries resulting from, F from the FBI operations, the department, as it does in other civilian operations ranging from natural disasters to crisis situations, provided medical support to the FBI. Under a 1991 Memorandum of Agreement between the Uniformed Services University for Health Sciences, which is DOD's medical school, and the FBI's hostage rescue team, we provided a team of medical specialists who would be ready to provide emergency medical care to any casualties of the law enforcement operations. These medical professionals were located in the vicinity of the Branch Davidian compound, but did not directly participate in the law enforcement operations. As an added precaution, the FBI requested and we made available three medical evacuation helicopters and medical personnel on standby at Fort Hood, Texas, should they be needed. They never left Fort Hood. The department provided other support to the FBI during March and April of 1993, such as gas masks, night vision devices, and training. I reiterate, though, that no DOD personnel performed any law enforcement functions. For example, we provided essentially driver training to ensure that the FBI personnel were properly qualified to operate the vehicles we provided. We also provided maintenance support and emergency medical support. Our support to the FBI was within congressionally directed limits and in keeping with Congress's intent that we share our specialized expertise and resources with civil authorities. Finally, I know there are questions among members of the Joint Committee concerning a meeting of four DOD personnel with the Attorney General and others on April 14, <clears throat> 1993, and particularly the role of two Army officers consulted by the Attorney General. The Department of Justice requested that the two Army officers attend the meeting and DOD approve the request. Before coming to Washington, one of the officers flew to Waco visited the area adjacent to the compound and met with an FBI representative. They then overflew the compound in a helicopter before boarding an FBI aircraft to fly to Washington. At the meeting, the Attorney General's questions centered on two general areas, the effects and risks associated with CS gas and the plan that the FBI had prepared. You have received testimony from one of the four DOD participants in that meeting, Dr. Harry Salem, a civilian employee of the Army, as to the information he provided about CS gas. As for the two Army officers, they related that they had experience with CS as a result of their military training. They advised the Attorney General that people's reactions to CS will vary. Some may panic. Others may try to continue to function normally by using expedients such as wet cloths to overcome the effects of the gas. When asked by the Attorney General about the FBI's plan, 
One of them pointed out that they were not qualified to pass judgment on law enforcement operations. They were not authorized to, and they did not approve or disapprove the plan. The two officers did point out that the plan differed from what they would plan if this had been a military operation. They emphasized that military operations call for the application of surprise, speed, and violence of action. In that light, they pointed out that in, that in a military operation, CS gas would be inserted into the whole compound at once, not incrementally as planned by the FBI. With respect to these Army officers, I am convinced that they acted professionally and appropriately at all times. I will conclude by stressing that the Department takes its statutory authority seriously. We are fully aware of the special charge given us by the Congress and the American people to support civil authorities. In this case, our support complied with that charge, and none of the DOD personnel who assisted law enforcement agencies during this difficult episode participated directly in any law enforcement operations. I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador. Um, the chair yields to Klinger. Uh, <clears throat> I thank the chairman for yielding to me, and I would be delighted to yield back to the chairman <coughs> my time. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, one, I'm trying just to clear up the record. Uh, when you were here with the panel last week, um, JTF-6 forces, the request that was made, um, was that made directly to the drug czar? No, the, 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 requ the request came from, from uh, Operation Alliance, the committee, the clearinghouse of law enforcement agencies, uh, to, to the uh, commanding general of JTF-6. And I'm trying to remember uh, exactly what the answer was that was given. There was some confusion. Was the, was the money that was used at Waco charged to the drug effort? During that period, let's, let's be clear here, during the first phase leading up to February 28, uh, when, when the ATF was uh, involved, uh, that there was a so-called drug connection, and the request was received through that channel. And uh, there is, we do have, uh, uh, funds to uh, to spend on counter drug operations, and so that was not that activity was not reimbursable. Well, while that, you know, I think the military responded based on the information they were given, and I understand that. But the significance here is is that if there was no drug connection, I think we pretty well proved that there wasn't one. Then charging the nation's drug war for the resources they have, the limited resources for those kind of operations needs to be avoided in the future. And it, I, just, I was just really concerned. We've covered all that ground before, but I just wanted to make sure. Why was the jamming equipment used at Waco? Uh, you, you indicated in your testimony, your opening statement, March 10th to, to March 17th, and then it was removed on the 18th. Um, does the use of such equipment need presidential approval or anybody's approval? Uh, the, that, it, that equipment that was used to interfere with the TV reception uh, is, uh, is approvable by uh, normal uh, DOD authorities. I mean, it, it is equipment that was requested, uh, and we respond to that under, under existing authority. We, uh, you, you read a partial list, and, and our, our subcommittees have have asked repeatedly for a full accounting of all military personnel and assets used at Waco. Uh, it's been two years now since the incident, and we're still trying to come up with an accounting. Um, do you have any idea of how long this will take? We're very close to completing that. We, we just want to be absolutely certain uh, that it is totally accurate, and we have circulated uh, our, our reply among various parts of the Defense Department so that we are able to give you a totally accurate accounting and, and, and we will send it to you. Because I, I think as we try to do our report, 
it's vital that we have very definite, specific information on not only assets, but um, uh, not only fixed assets from tanks to, to Humvees and everything else, but also personnel itself needs to be diagrammed. We, we will, we will uh, do our best to get an accurate accounting of the personnel as well. Let, let me hasten to add here that it, it may be uh, extremely difficult to give you an exact accounting of the number of people on any given day, but I think we can come very close to giving you a total picture of the personnel that were there essentially to provide maintenance and training and so forth. In your advice to Attorney General Reno, um, can you just describe uh, what, what, the, uh, what the folks there said to her relative to uh, their assurance that CS gas was harmful or not harmful to children? Any, any information relative to, to the military's experience? Well, based, based on the experience of the two military, the two Army officers concerned who uh, have, have used CS gas in training on many occasions, uh, their response to the Attorney General's question was that, uh, that, the, the, uh, that reactions vary according to the individual person concerned. Uh, some people panic and uh, want to leave the vicinity as quickly as they can, uh, and others are able to and, and use such expedients as might be at hand, such as a wet cloth, to try to overcome the effects of the gas. But basically their point was there, there is no way of knowing exactly how any two people would react to it. But specifically, <clears throat> and I just, since I know the red light's on, but my question was to little children, I mean, people who were very little, two years old, less than two years old, any any reference I, to your concerns? I'm not, I'm not aware that that they were asked, uh, nor did they respond directly to the effects on children, which, which obviously from the point of view of their military training and experience, uh, would not have been relevant. So so just to make the record clear, you were never asked the question to comment relative to children. You were just asked the use of CS gas with respect to, to people. Right, to people. To the best of my Assuming knowledge. adults, and your experience has been with adults, and you would assume that, you know, adults could have gas masks and work them, but you weren't looking at, at, at children. To, to the best of my knowledge, uh, that was uh, the extent of, of their exchange. Mr. Scott, Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Holmes, as I understand it, you can get uh, military assistance in a number of different ways, and depending on which category you ask, you have to reimburse or not reimburse. As you do this accounting, will that include who is reimbursed, who for what, so that we can figure out under what category the assistance was obtained? Well, if you, if you, if I understand your question, if you would like a, a basic division as between uh, the, the support that well, was... Let me ask it another way. Has the military been reimbursed for any expenses at Waco? I can't answer that. Uh, I, I assume that... Wh who could answer? Well, we'll, we'll have to, I'll have to ask the question of the Department of Defense. Okay. Uh, but I, I believe that a great deal of the accounting has taken place, but I can't... I can't give you a definitive answer okay. as that's, to that, that's who and what and how much. If you could uh, follow up on that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, does the military have experience dealing with uh, cults and people who you're engaging with that might have beliefs that are totally different than... Um, I didn't understand the first word you said. Cult. Experience with? with? With dealing with people involved in cults. Oh, uh, cults. Oh so that uh, the reaction may not be what you would expect it to be. Is there any expertise in that area? Not to the best of my knowledge. You indicated that the military would have gone in all at once and not incrementally. Has anyone evaluated the possibility of that working as opposed to what was actually done to your knowledge? Not in the Department of Defense. 
Okay, back to the uh, gas. We were told that um, by a number of different people who had a background in uh, CS gas that in the annals of history, they don't know anybody who has experienced long-term medical problems or death as a result of CS gas, and it's the safest thing out there. It is very traumatic while you're under the CS <clears throat> gas, but as soon as it's gone, everybody recovers. Did, was anything told to the Attorney General different than that? I don't believe so, but I'm, I'm not sure that the question, okay, what, as you posed it, was posed to the, the two Army officers the, the, in that way. The question I think that you answered was that the psychological reaction is totally unpredictable. That people under gas, you well, just don't yeah, know I what they might do. Yeah, I didn't use the word psychological, but I just simply related that the two officers said that any two individuals could, uh, could react in totally different ways. Some might panic, and some might be more controlled, and cease to use, and, and attempt to use expedients for controlling the effects of the, of the gas. And, and is your recollection that um, because of that, there's just no way to predict what people might do? Yes. That is your, re that is that, that, your, that your is what recollection? The, what basically what the Army officers were saying. Okay. to the Attorney General. Do, um, <clears throat> you indicated the, uh, law the military were not involved in the law enforcement. Um, do military officers have expertise in civilian law enforcement? Generally not, although clearly within the military police function for carrying out uh, the Uniform Code of Military Justice on military bases. Obviously, military police and their officers are, are schooled in those techniques, but... But that's not appropriate for civilian no, type use. No, it, it is not appropriate and, and it's not used. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, Chair yields to Mr. McCollum. Ambassador Holmes, I'd like for you to confirm for us or corroborate the fact that I believe is correct that all of the vehicles you provided to the FBI for the Waco uh, siege period, the combat engineering vehicles, the Bradley fighting vehicles, and the M1A1 tanks uh, had had their weapons systems disabled or removed before you provided them to the uh, FBI. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I also want to go back to the meeting that the two Army, uh, senior Army officers had with Attorney General Reno in discussing the CS gas and the plan. Uh, am I not correct that among other things that they said to her with regard to the CS gas plan that was a statement that there are risks associated with it and that mothers may leave their children when it's inserted? I, I do recall that uh, one of the officers concerned uh, involved did say, uh, in the context of explaining the, the different reactions, said uh, something like uh, some mothers might abandon their children. Uh, also, I am concerned about the question about whether or not they gave any advice to the Attorney General regarding taking out the leader at the beginning of the operation. Am I not correct that in a military operation as opposed to a law enforcement operation, these uh, two Army officers advised the Attorney General there would be that type of action? Uh, the two Army officers concerned did not advise the Attorney General in this regard. They simply stated that were, were it a military mission that they would use s speed, surprise, violence of action and go for the leader. All right. Thank you. Uh, also in that same discussion, uh, am I not correct that these two uh, Army officers advised the Attorney General uh, their opinion that the hostage rescue team uh, needed to be pulled offline at some point uh, to restore their perishable skills so they would not to deteriorate further both mental and physical? Let me rephrase that in, in replying. Uh, they didn't advise the Attorney General that they should do that, that she should do that. They said that, again, if it were a military operation, uh, they would have their soldiers um, rotated off the site in order to maintain their perishable skills. All right, that's all I wanted. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I just need to get it out no, somehow. I just want or to get it accurate. <laughs> that's what I want you to, too. Uh, and with regard to 
the meeting itself and its initiation, am I, uh, who, let me ask it this way, do you know who actually asked the two Army officers to come to this meeting with Attorney General Reno? Who the contact point was? The contact point was, was an FBI official. Was it Dick Rogers? And I believe it was, uh, Rogers was the head of the hostage rescue team. I believe it was Rogers who was the contact point. Now, with regard to the jamming equipment uh, that was used mm -hmm. to prevent the Davidians from receiving television signals, you indicated that the operation of this equipment was by civilians. Uh, did you mean the FBI? You did not mean civilian military personnel, did you? No, I... Let me just check something here. The, uh, the equipment to interfere with the reception of the TV signals uh, was operated by DOD civilians. It, it was by DOD civilians? Yes. Let me ask you uh, another question just to express uh, an explanation here on the uh, hostage rescue team perishable skill issue. Did uh, at any time, uh, to your knowledge, uh, after the comment was made about how uh, they would be pulled back in the military operation to... Uh, if it was the military's team out there to renew their skills. Was there a response from the Attorney General or from any of the FBI present as to what their position was with respect to their team that the military officers Yes, I recall heard? that the two, that the Army officers concerned, um, that they, they mentioned that the FBI officials in charge um, said that, in, that they were confident that their um, people were prepared because they had used um, makeshift, makeshift uh, training facilities in the vicinity uh, to keep their training up. Something to, something to that effect. Uh, I, I would not try to characterize precisely how the FBI replied because I work for the Defense Department. I think to be absolutely accurate on that, you might want to, to ask the FBI. But I, well, I thank you. I, I just wanted to get the, response, the way, that way. response of how the uh, military officers uh, observed or remembered uh, that, yeah. that conversation. That's all I was trying to get. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. Thank you. Mrs. Slaughter from New York. Five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ambassador, it's nice to see you again. See you, I'm not altogether clear why you're back, um, either to try to prove once again the Attorney General didn't understand this issue. What I hear more and more is that she tried everywhere in the world to consult everybody that, that she could find about the gas. Um, and that um, then given every kind of, uh, and, and frankly we heard it all here, uh, there were a couple of people who said that, uh, that nobody really knew, but experts who really worked with it had said, as what we pointed before and it's on the record, that no person has suffered any debilitating conditions or death as a use of CS gas. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure you were aware that this morning it was put into the record that the autopsy reports from all the people who died on that unfortunate day, uh, that not a single one died from CS gas. Did you know that? I did not. Well, it, we, no matter how often we say it, we seem to still come back to see what did CS gas kill anybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, sort of like Alice in Wonderland, we'll believe six impossible things before breakfast, I guess. One of the things that, that concerns me is the difference in law enforcement and the Defense Department. I think you're trying to make this very clear. And that the chain of events here sometimes gets forgotten. Because we talk all the time about whether you need to know all about cults, does law enforcement need to understand all about cults? You were not there because this was a cult. In the first place, the law enforcement wasn't called in by the local sheriff because of illegal weapons. Isn't that correct? Uh, I, only, I only know from, frankly, from uh, public, publicly available information. Is it your understanding that they were called in because they were stockpiling machine guns and hand grenades and other weapons that, that were illegal to that's, have? That's what, I, that's what I've heard, but I mean, I don't have any, any direct personal knowledge of that. Well, my, uh, my concern is if every law enforcement agency decides it has to understand every cult, 
uh, I can, that's going to be a pretty difficult problem because we've heard from numbers of various experts here who've disagreed completely with each other and who are to this moment still giving me reports on, on how they differ from what other members have said. Um, but the Defense Department, I think we need to restate what you had said before. You feel that you were there on legitimate grounds? We feel that we were responding according to our statutory authority to uh, requests from civil authorities, from law enforcement, for help from uh, DOD because of our uh, specialized expertise and uh, resources. And as we keep talking about the two officers who spoke to the Attorney General, it was not their position to tell her how to run the operation because the military itself was not in charge of it. Isn't that correct? Absolutely true. They were not in charge and they were not trying to tell her how to run the operation. They, I mean, the, the advice on whether she should take out Koresh or this kind of thing would not be the kind of advice that we would expect from the military. Is that correct? In the well, they did not operation? advise her. They did not uh, seek to advise her on whether to take out Koresh or not. Isn't it the absolute truth that there is a wall between civilian, military, and the control that they have over populations? And that their uh, the roles and missions that they have are entirely different, and that the military is not allowed to do civilian police patrolling in the United States? Uh, it, is, it is true that the military are enjoined by statute, particularly the Posse Comitatus Act, from acting as law enforcement and in, in, uh, they're pre prevented from arresting, arrests, searches, seizures. And unless uh, called matters. in, uh, and particularly the National Guard, which can come time be called in by a governor for riot control or some sorts of things, uh, is not normal for the Department of Defense in any way to be involved. Well, it's not, it's not normal for the Department of Defense under Title 10, but uh, it is my understanding that under Title 32 that uh, National Guard uh, working under the authority of a governor has has more latitude in that regard. Correct, as I, and I would stated yeah. that already. But what I'd like to hear you say, Ambassador Holmes, before my time expires, are you satisfied, to the best of your knowledge, that everything that was done, that was done here, was done correctly, and was done by the books, and was done by the law of the United States, and under no kind of conspiracy theory? A hundred percent. I totally agree. And I am I am satisfied that everything was done according to the statute and according to uh, legal delegated authority of the officials of the Department of Defense that responded to the request for support. Thank I, you, Mr. Ambassador. I, I assume, Mr. Ambassador, that includes the question of ATF's request for, your, for the military uh, and with a drug connection as well? Well, yes, I, because, because that request came through uh, Operation Alliance, which was a clearinghouse of all law enforcement agencies uh, who were in, whose, whose responsibility it was to pass requests vetted by them uh, to, to the Joint Task Force. Chair now recognize Mr. Boyer. <clears throat> I have uh, several questions, but I, I have to state a particular confusion I have at the moment by the gentlelady's questions of, of New York to say that isn't it the reason there were automatic weapons is why the DOD was brought in, that, that kind of discounts the fact that we went through all these hearings about a drug nexus. Chairman, I'll yield to the gentlelady to help just me. Just a moment, sir. I did not say that. I said that the law enforcement, uh, the, the, the county sheriff had called in law enforcement ATF specifically because of the stockpiling of illegal weapons. All it right. was not the fact that there was a call there. Called? I never even said that. I'll, I'll Taking, taking back my time. Well, I, I never I, said there was, a, there was a call. Let me move Let me move in because I think part of the problem that we went through was is this whole thing about whether there was a ruse about a drug nexus to gain access to the military treasure trove. So let me, let me uh, move into the other thing that bothered me about your opening statement when you referred to uh, M1 tanks, 10 Bradleys, 12 Hummers, some CEVs and helicopters. When you say DOD, are you putting National Guard under that umbrella? Yes. Okay, so I think because, that's pretty because important. Because the ten, the ten Bradleys, the because ten Bradleys were actually from the uh, National Texas National Guard at Fort Hood. I think it would be very helpful for the committee, Mr. Holmes, if, if when you provide the list to us, that you make a separation between that which is provided from the active and that which is coming out of the National Guard, and especially on the issues of, of reimbursement, uh, because I know that looking at the National Guard after action report. 
Uh, it says in here that federal LEAs uh, have agreed to reimburse the Texas National Guard for consumables and lost damage and repair to Texas National Guard and equipment in the amount of $205,752. And so, they might, so it'll be helpful to us to know whether or not there were active duty equipment that were damaged or lost and that you'd sought reimbursement. And then hopefully you'll begin to ask this question too that you know, now that we're learning that there was this rouge to create access, as I, again, I said, the military treasure trove, that, that you, sir, will analyze that. I know the President, or the Secretary of Defense has appointed you to this task force to look at the access question, but hopefully uh, you'll begin to look at also this question about, uh, I know you don't always want to say, well, geez, is this federal agency asking me, or, or are they being truthful in their request? But now that we know that uh, perhaps it wasn't uh, as upfront, are you going to be seeking reimbursement, or are you just going to say, well, had they asked, the, had they asked for the request through other access means, uh, they could have gotten it, therefore we'll just discount it. So I appreciate you'll look into that, We, we will look into that. We will right. include that uh, for the record in our response. I'd like to point, out, I'd like to point out, however, that the, that the more detail that is required in this response of that sort means that it will take longer. All right. One thing that I, that I do also want to, to get into is, is that the military did, in their advice uh, to Ms. Reno, uh, <clears throat> advised to, to uh, bring the, uh, about the, the, the advice to withdraw the HRT team. Now that in fact happened, correct? That in fact, the advice to her to, to withdraw the team in fact happened. No, they, they did not advise her to withdraw the HRT team. So the justice report is incorrect. What they, I, I, I covered this earlier. Uh, let me rephrase it. Well, uh, the, the question was asked, and they responded that if it were a military operation, that they would uh, rotate their, their people off the site in order to maintain perishable skills. See, but the but they, did not, the, they did not advise her to do the same with the HRT. Mr. Holmes, that was what not we have here is a situation where Mr. Hubble, even though Mr. Sage says that it was, uh, quote, overstated, Mr. Hubble, Hubble is advising the Attorney General that on the scene in Waco, law enforcement personnel Waco were getting tired, their temper, tempers were fraying, even in the after action report from the National Guard. They said that uh, considering the magnitude, severity, and scope of the particular support mission, few if any major problems were encountered. However, personalities, vanities, and opinions did surface to near problematic degrees that can be attributed to stress and sleepless and concerned personnel. So what we have is, is, in fact, that predicament where you have the highly perishable skills are, in fact, perishing. And the military says, you know, if this was one of our, our actions, when we, move, when we move in with speed and violence of action and surprise, we would do it now. But, but I'll tell you what, because of the readiness concern, we recommend withdrawing from the scene. Now, that's a, that, in fact, occurred, correct? No. No, then, then, I, I then don't convey it, please. Uh, 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 Congressman, don't expect me to comment on the, on the nature of the conversation between Mr. Hubble and the Attorney General. I will comment on what our military officers advised. They, they did not advise them to withdraw the HRT. And I repeat, they said if it were a military operation and these were our people, we would rotate them off so as to train and maintain their perishable skills. Well, I, I, I was hopeful that uh, others wouldn't have to come in and testify. I prefer to consult with the chair here in just a moment. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, Jackson Lee. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I'm sorry, Ambassador, that we seem to have uh, uh, a uh, directed uh, effort to put words in your mouth and allegations of who's pro and con. I hope I'm just here to get facts and to help us uh, be able to recoup for, on behalf of the American people both the truth and ways to avoid the loss of these uh, terrible, uh, this terrible tragedy and loss of lives both with ATF and certainly uh, members of the Branch Davidians. Uh, I want to uh, ask you to call off uh, what your actual title is. I'm reading it here and I want to make sure that uh, I've got the right information. Um, listed as Ambassador H. Allen Holmes and what is your title, sir? Well, actually, I'm Mr. H. Allen Holmes. 
Well. <laughs> and, uh, and I am Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict. All right. Mr. Holmes, and uh, we uh, certainly conferred upon you, maybe because of your demeanor, Ambassador. Uh, but um, what the American people, I understand, are sensitive to <clears throat> uh, is the fact that we are in a democracy. And whether or not uh, we are uh, in a situation <clears throat> where the military can be put out into the field to put the American people under siege, is uh, this title that you've just given to me and the responsibilities they're under a covert operation to put the American people under siege? Certainly not. And would the, that be absolutely the special, not? Special operations and low intensity conflict has to do with my oversight responsibilities for policy and the resources of special operations forces. Uh, I, sh I should add that beyond that, I also have responsibility for the counter drug operations of the program of the Department of Defense and uh, humanitarian and refugee affairs. So we should not read into that a concerted and directed effort uh, to move about uh, these uh, contained United States and territories and uh, act upon uh, uh, American citizens uh, lawfully uh, following the law. Absolutely not. The Department of Defense is there to provide uh, national security to fight and win our nation's wars. And I mean, obviously, we're not um, operating against the American people. We're operating in support of the American people. Did uh, you have, uh, not you, but uh, mm -hmm. do you have an understanding where the military came on the scene after Oklahoma City? Yes, I have an understanding. Were they, what mode were they in? Were they in an assistance mode? Uh, what mode do you understand that they might have been in? Absolutely in an assistance mode. There had been a, there had been a terrorist attack. They were basically helping with the, what we call consequence management of that, of that great tragedy and provided uh, a, a range of, of support that was requested by uh, civil authorities to help help with the people, look for people, dog teams, and ambulance, mobile. I mean, all kinds of, of assistance to, to help uh, with, with that tragedy. Uh, quite a different set of circumstances, but many of us in the South remember it, Hurricane Andrew, great loss of life. Yes. Do you believe that military might have been on the scene there after the fact? That, that is another, another one of another category of support that we provide to civil authorities when there, when there are, are natural and man-made disasters and yes. We, we Not in any conspiratorial way. Let me get my last question in and get back to the drug nexus question. That seems to have been the draw on what would have drawn military assistance. Let me give you my understanding, sir, and you can give me your answer. I understand that the drug nexus uh, emphasis was that if you provided assistance, then because of legislation that you would operate under, the agency would not have to reimburse. It does not mean that that was the only basis upon which you could enter upon the scene. It had to be with not having to reimburse. I want to finish my question so you can answer. Yeah. And there was a variety of activities, including uh, past uh, 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 felons or, or convictions of people that were inside and various other indicia that the ATF may have brought to the military's attention. But in any event, if you can again explain the drug nexus situation that would have caused uh, the military to be involved. But let me, let me, maybe it would be helpful to approach it from a different direction. I welcome there, that. There is, since 1989, we have been uh, we have been given legislation to, uh, to participate in the national uh, fight against drugs. And for five years, uh, we have received appropriations uh, from the Congress to do this. Uh, and so these appropriations cover the, the, a, a, a wide range of activities of, of military support to law enforcement in going after the drug dealers. Joint Task Force 6 is solely engaged in that activity. And so when, when they receive a request from Operation Alliance, which includes all of law enforcement agencies, because all law enforcement agencies in one way or another, at one time or another, are involved in going after drug dealers. When they receive a, a request for assistance, which has been vetted, they take that, they examine it, they look at it from the legal point of view, from the command point of view. There's always a general officer that looks at it. And when they are satisfied, they then execute that, that military support to, 
to civil authorities Joint for that purpose. And it is, it, is not reimburse, it is not necessary to reimburse because there is a program to pay for that, which is appropriated by Congress. And that's the nexus that we were talking about. That's the door that was opened yeah. for the participation in Waco. That's correct. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank <clears throat> you, Mr. Holmes. The, uh, <clears throat> the problem is, is that the money gets charged to the drug war. That and I and I appreciate you saying that, and that's why I want Mr. Holmes to to say that that uh, the efforts were in good faith. They tracked the inquiry, they looked at what that's was correct. provided, and they made a good faith effort. And you're right, it came out of dollars legislated we, for the drug war, and that's what I understand the ATF's inquiry was that they thought there might be drug activity going on inside the compound. Whether that was accurate or not, but that was the basis upon which the first inquiry was made to the military. And I think I think it's since been proved that it was rather inaccurate, but. Uh, we're, we're anyway, in hindsight, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I hope we Mr. can fix all of that for the American people. I really do. I, I'll work with you to do so. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Schiff, New Mexico. <clears throat> Chairman, I, I'd just like to use part of my time to continue uh, what, what the Chair and Ms. Jackson Lee are talking about. I think the evidence is overwhelming that this was never a drug raid by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. It was always a raid for, alle for alleged violations of firearms laws. And the reason BATF told the military that this was drug involved is that was the only way that they were going to get the training that they received from Joint Task Force 6, because Joint Task Force 6 only helps in, in, in drug interdiction. And uh, what I think that further shows is the fact that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms was, was committed to this idea of a military raid to be followed by a press conference. Uh, regardless of the risk to children inside, and regardless of the risk of their own agents who they, who they sent forward. And Ambassador Holmes, I didn't mean to make you sit through that, but I, I think that needs to be clarified, particularly when I see from the Associated Press that the Secretary of the Treasury, Rubin, is throwing verbal bombs at this committee and saying that we might be undermining law enforcement, not supporting law enforcement. I think that the Treasury Department didn't support law enforcement to, to abrogate its oversight responsibility of the, of the Bureau for what the Bureau helped do to its own agents. Um, Mr. Holmes, I'd like to ask you this question. I believe you said that Department of Defense civilian personnel were, were uh, operating some surveillance equipment at the Waco site? I, no, I no. said that, that uh, DOD uh, civilians were, were operating equipment that interfered with the reception of TV signals uh, in the compound for approximately five days in, mid-March. Right. Were they operating from some location other than right around the Waco compound? It was, they, I'm that was operated, it was operated right there in the vicinity. I don't, I don't recall exactly uh, where it was, but it was, it was definitely right there in the Waco vicinity, right. yes. What, what agency did those, within the DOD, what agency, what service did those civilians come from? Uh, they came from the, the Air Force. And uh, if we need their names, are you able to provide that at some point? I think we could do that. Right. I don't you. see why not. Right. Um, there have been some questions that have come up about what the Attorney General was told and how this plan was proposed. And uh, I'd like to ask you, from your knowledge of the military's discussion, if, if you're able to respond. Um, one issue is how likely it was that the first vehicle that went forward might receive hostile gunfire from inside the compound because it's been testified that would trigger uh, an all sides assault on the building to put gas in uh, from many different sides at once. Do you have an understanding of whether the, the FBI said this was likely to occur, that his gunfire was likely to occur to this first vehicle, or was not likely? If I can't do. really. Uh, reply to whether it was likely for the first vehicle, but I, I can say that the reason uh, that the FBI requested and the Defense Department provided some armored vehicle was for force protection. And therefore, uh, it's clear that they were expecting to receive uh, gunfire and they were interested in pr protecting the lives of the agents. Well, I want to say the reason that's important, and we'll take this up with the Attorney General tomorrow, is whether there'd be gun gunfire, and it can only be from one person necessarily in the compound, that would change the whole scenario of what was about to happen, and that's why I emphasize the point. 
On the use of CS gas, um, I wonder if the military uh, civilians or members who were advising the Attorney General had any examples uh, from anywhere in the world of where they knew CS gas had been planned to be pumped into or was pumped into a building continuously for 48 hours or was deliberately inserted to a building where children and infants were present. Do you, do you know of any such examples of either of those? I, I only know that, that in, in training that the, the military uh, use the Army, all, all the services do, the Marine Corps, uses CS gas in training, and so they're quite familiar uh, with, with its effects, to basically to train their soldiers on how to react in these, in these situations. Well, well that's soldiers. My, my, just to follow up briefly, do you know of any examples of either a plan to put CS gas into a building for 48 hours straight against inhabitants who might be there anywhere, or a plan to insert gas into the building in any amount for any duration of time where there's children or infants present? I, I don't know of any such plan. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. Uh, Mr. Schumer, five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you, Ambassador, for your patience here. Um, I guess the fundamental question is, let us say there was no drug nexus at all, and let us say that the ATF, just suppose, mm -hmm. said we don't have any drug nexus and we need your help. Isn't it true that every one of the actions that the military uh, officers and advisors did would have still been able to have been done, even if with different personnel? Yeah, I think I may have even said that in my first day of testimony. You did, but that if you there know. Was, if even without a drug connection, uh, just as in the case of the of the Pentagon's response to the FBI in Phase Two, there are many ways that military support to law enforcement can be requested and granted. That is exactly right. That's, that is the point I'm making. Yeah. So we may have a question here of the credibility of whoever in the ATF asked the military for help in terms of the drug yeah. connection. But we have, there is not the slightest scintilla of a doubt that no law was broken. Is that correct? Certainly from Certainly from the Defense Department standpoint, uh, we did certainly not break any laws. And nothing was done that couldn't have been done with or without a drug uh, nexus. Is that right? Well. Am I asking too convoluted a no, question? No, I'm just, here? I will just say simply that, that the Defense Department will always receive. No, and but that's and not my question. My question is, I, I'll ask you again, you yeah. know, there's a, I asked it initially. Aside from the fact that there is a sort of bureaucratic way of paying for these things, and some comes out of the war on drugs, and some comes out of the defense budget. Every single action that any military officer did in connection with Waco would have been allowed whether there was a drug nexus or not under the present law. Is that correct? I believe in general that that's correct, but the reason I'm hesitating is that um, every request for support that comes from law enforcement I mean, obviously, we, we don't just blindly sure. execute it. I mean, we would, we would always no, want to this examine every request very carefully from the point of view of law and sure. command and control. So that, that's the reason it's difficult for me to give you a blanket I response. I didn't say in every, I meant yeah. in regards to this particular incident, the training that went on with ATF and with uh, FBI for preparation of the siege in Waco. I think, I think that's probably so. I mean, if... If those requests had come in and there had been no uh, no connection with drugs, they, they probably, I mean, they certainly would have been treated as honest, uh, you know, straightforward requests, and they would have been looked at. And, ha and But I, I, I can think of no I'm not reason asking, why. would it have been approved? I'm saying, let's yeah. say now in hindsight we know that there was no drug nexus. Could, not would, but yeah. well, let's, could every single action let, been allowed under present well, law? I, if not, we should know about it too. I haven't, I haven't done that kind of an analysis. Uh, uh, but, but let's say, for example, I mean, hypothetically, let's say that they had requested, they said there were uh, some, uh, mili some armored vehicles to protect their agents. I, right. I think that it's safe to say that that would have been granted. Right. Whether or not there was a, 
a drug connection. And how about some training, not for a specific operation, but on sort of siege? But type certainly, action. certainly in terms of, of training for uh, medical, uh, um, for medical emergencies and for communications and that sort of thing. Uh, I think that would have all been uh, responded to in in a positive way. Well, certainly summing up, I have not heard a single jot come out of any member of this committee or anywhere else other than, again, you know, some of the conspiracy type uh, theorists and uh, allegations made or implied in Soldier of Fortune and other places like that, not my Bible on what, what is proper and improper. Um, but I haven't heard a single, single allegation that talks about any violation of law. And Thank you. Mr. Coble from North Carolina. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Ambassador, I'm going to reiterate a point I made earlier this week, uh, la earlier uh, last week, rather. I met with a friend of mine who's one of the foremost attorneys in North Carolina who was up here for a meeting. And responding to our Waco hearings, he voluntarily told me, he said, when I first saw the report on television, I called my wife into the den and said, have the federal agents lost their minds? We've been in the process of applying 2020 hindsight for the past seven or eight days. This was his instinctive response. He was applying no hindsight at all. Have they lost their minds? Not being critically necessarily, just a gut feeling that something was wrong. And I think, Mr. Ambassador and Mr. Chairman, I think that's why we had these hearings. I think many Americans responded in that same vein, not because Koresh was doing things properly, but because they feared the federal government was doing things improperly. And since we have saddled you, Mr. Ambassador, with the idea of compiling information, I have one more request for you. And this is one of these things, Mr. Chairman, that nags at you. Hearings like this, now and again, something will stand out that nags at you. Damage to the tank. Tanks. It was reported in the FBI report that one of the reasons why they accelerated the insertion of the gas was because they were being fired upon from inside. Folks inside conversely deny that they were firing upon the tanks. Here's what bothers me. On June the 8th, this subcommittee requested a copy of the damage report to the tanks. There were obviously no, no gunfire between March 1st and April 18th. So any damage sustained by the tank would had to have occurred on the 19th. And that would, common sense tells me, would be reflected in the, in the damage report. I'm at a loss why we haven't gotten that report. Almost two months ago, we requested it. Over two years have elapsed since this occurred. Surely the damage report had been compiled. I realize, and this is not your fault, about, but I realize the wheels of bureaucracy turn awfully slowly in this town, but after two years, Number one, can you illuminate for me? And if you can't, <clears throat> can you get that information for us as to why we hadn't gotten yeah. the report yet? I, I wasn't aware that there was a request for a damage uh, assessment. And, I'm, but, and I'm not whipping up on but, you, Ambassador. But I'll, I'll, be, I'll be glad to look into it and see, see what we can produce. I presume that the report was, I, I assume it, it was directed to DOD. And, uh, and I'm not blaming you for, for the fact that we don't have it. But I'm blaming somebody, because it seems to me after two months, we ought to have that report in hand and examine that, what damage, if any, did occur. I thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for being here. Mr. Chairman, that's the only question I had. If you want to, anybody want my time? Okay, thank you, Mr. Coble. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, the fact that you indicated that uh, the Air Force uh, used jamming devices and uh, I believe uh, that was for about a week, and then they left on the 18th. Uh, why'd they leave? I, I really don't know why they left, but they did. <laughs> we just thought it was a good idea to do for a week and then, then leave? I don't know. Let me consult some of my colleagues. 
And I understand they would. Yeah, they I would think DOD probably civilians. Probably the answer uh, should uh, that that question should be directed to the FBI. I mean, they, you know, okay, we'll do that. They must have asked, said that they didn't need them. So. And my question really is: is they were DOD civilians? I think I heard you say. Yes. And they were actually they were manning those devices. Yes, they 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 ran that equipment. Unlike. And I think there were perhaps a mixture of DOD civilians and perhaps contractors. I'm not quite sure of the breakdown. But unlike the situation where the FBI was actually manning the tanks. And That's right. Everything else, all other equipment, uh, was run by, by, the, by the FBI. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Chairman, I would like to reserve my time. Mr. Conyers. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Good afternoon, Ambassador Holmes. We've met before. This is your second time here? Yes. Well, you're lucky. There, some have been back more than twice. Uh, you've been here. The last panel you were on, were you here for six hours or more? I think it was about four hours. About four hours. On the 20th. All right. And so we're, we're sputtering along here. We're just about almost out of gas. We brought back all the witnesses we could think of to take them through their paces one more time. Believe me, I had nothing to do with this. Do, do you have any new and final information that upon this eager two committees of Congress, you would give us your last and final parting words about this whole Sorry, incident. I, I really uh, thank you for that invitation, Congressman, but I really don't have anything to add to, to the statement uh, that I made at the beginning and to the questions that I've answered uh, during, during this hearing. Well, I, I had that feeling ever since you've been here this afternoon that there, there was, we were plowing through the, the same sort of thing. And uh, I would yield my time uh, thanking you very much for your courtesy and cooperation with these committees. And uh, if there is no request for my time, I'd yield it back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Um, mm. Mr. Uh, Chabot. Thank you. I'll yield uh, my first 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Schiff. Thank the gentleman for yielding. As a still recognized uh, judge advocate in the Air Force Reserve, I want to take just a minute to clarify the issue of drugs and training. The plain fact is this, although there may not have been a violation of a statute like the Posse Comitatus Act, Joint Task Force 6, which provided the training to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, would never have done so unless they believed that this was a drug mission because that was their mission. That's correct. And the argument is, thank you, Ambassador. The argument has been made, well, BATF could have gotten this training for its agents through another uh, uh, part of the military if they had been willing to reimburse the military. That is true. And I think the most probable response on that is BATF did not have the budget it wanted to commit to reimburse the military. And that's why they misled the military into believing that this was a drug raid. And I believe they did that so they'd get the training so that they could go ahead with their plan for a military assault on this compound, even though it was a grave risk to the people who were inside and it was a grave risk to their own agents some of whom paid for their, with their lives for that decision. With that, I yield back to Mr. Shabbat and thank him. Uh, Ambassador Holmes, um, first of all, were, were there any military personnel from any other countries other than the U.S. Uh, at Waco? I, I'm not aware of, of, any, of any military uh, other than the U.S. that were, were there, certainly not uh, at, at the invitation of the Department of Defense. Okay, let me be a little more specific. Um, when you say you're not aware, I'm not talking about on February 28th. I'm talking about, say, from the 1st of March through uh, April 19th. Um, and I don't mean necessarily taking part <clears throat> in, in any of the uh, uh, activities that occurred there. Yeah. Uh, but have you had any discussions uh, with any of our military personnel that uh, uh, that might indicate that there were any uh, military personnel from any other countries there? 
It's my understanding that uh, at the invitation uh, of perhaps the um, FBI uh, hostage rescue team that there may have been one or two uh, personnel from the British SAS there at some point uh, as observers at some point uh, during, during the long siege. So there, there were military personnel there from another country? I mean, th that, that is what I have been led to believe. I don't have any direct knowledge of that. What I do know is that there were, that uh, if there, uh, that the SAS uh, one or two people uh, that are supposed to have been there were not there uh, as a result of a DOD invitation. So uh, it really... Okay, well, I wasn't specifically getting at who invited so them. So that, that's why I don't have, I can't give you, you know, sort of direct confirmation of that from, from the point of view of the Department of Defense. But, but it is our understanding that there, uh, that there were uh, a, a cup, one or two, I think, uh, SAS uh, personnel there at the invitation of the FBI. Okay. Let me get away from that for a minute. My time's running out here. But uh, the two officers that you mentioned that went and met with uh, Attorney General uh, Reno, um, what, what rank were they? Uh, one, uh, one was a colonel and one was a brigadier general. Okay, a colonel and a general. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you mentioned that they, I believe they flew in a helicopter around the compound at one point? One, one of them did. Okay, was that in the daytime or at nighttime? Uh, it was in the daytime. And then from that helicopter, they then got they then, on, uh, on another flight. That, that, and then what, that yes, uh, that officer then flew uh, after uh, flying briefly over over the area, over the compound area, the Waco area, just to have a look. And did they uh, land that several officer times? Then flew. Did they land several times at the compound site? I don't think so. I, I mean, I don't really know, but I think. Basically, they just did one, uh, one quick fly around in the helicopter, and then they got an FBI aircraft and flew to Washington. And immediately met with uh, the Attorney General. And then, right? and then met, and met with the Attorney General at FBI headquarters. Okay, well, my time's out. On I'd April like to 14. follow up. But, okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Watt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, Ambassador Holmes, uh, for in some of our communities where <clears throat> we have seen the National Guard on various occasions, um, we never realized that there was this dichotomy between the military and the, and the law enforcement uh, uh, personnel. I wonder if you might uh, spend a minute or two just um, informing the American people um, who may be watching today what, what this, the philosophy of posse comitatus is and what in fact it that the um, law consists of well <clears throat> for a really authoritative reading i would i would refer you to uh general huffman's uh statement that was entered in the record on the on the hearing on the 20th but based on on what he explained to me um my understanding is that the posse comitatus act was passed in i think it was 1878 and basically the purpose was during re the reconstruction period to, pr to ensure that military personnel were not carrying out civilian law. And therefore, uh, the, the law uh, prescribes military personnel from carrying out such law enforcement functions as arrests, searches, and seizures. Now, I take it that uh, we have uh, maybe taken a tiny step or two back from that um, uh, philosophy uh, in uh, our efforts to deal with the drug uh, situation in this country, in our efforts uh, possibly in the upcoming statute to deal with uh, terrorism, domestic terrorism, um, and international terrorism in, in tandem with each other, I guess. Um, it, it, is my perception uh, correct that that uh, that maybe we've taken a tiny step back from that uh, philosophy? Not, not in the prosecution of, of the counter-drug war. Uh, the, the Posse Comitatus Act 
remains in place. And uh, I would not say that it represents a step back. No, I mean, there is a clear separation here. And whether or not we, our military, are supporting law enforcement uh, of authorities within the United States or in those foreign countries where there is a drug problem and where we are working, for example, in the Andean region, we're, we are very careful not to overstep uh, that boundary. Uh, with, res with respect to counterterrorism, um, it, uh, it, is, it is possible in a, would there be a, a serious national crisis within the United States involving um, weapons of mass destruction, particularly nuclear weapons, uh, I believe that the President would have the authority uh, to uh, send uh, military uh, uh, units uh, into action to support uh, the FBI and the Justice Department in, in taking care of that kind of very grave threat to the American people. And, and how does the use of the National Guard in riot situations fit into this whole overall context? Well, if the National Guard is called out by the governor in a situation and is, and is operating under Title 32, uh, then that uh, I, there, the National Guard is, is acting, I think, closer to a quasi-law enforcement um, capacity um, than, would be, than would be the case for norm, normal military forces uh, operating under Title 10. Okay, I, I've used these, clear uh, this series of questions just to kind of get uh, uh, the public up to a at least a generalized <clears throat> level of knowledge about the separation between the military and uh, and domestic law enforcement, uh, and and leading to the final question, which I have, uh, which is, have you had an opportunity um, uh, since the Waco event to review uh, in some detail the steps that the military uh, took whatever they might have been and to determine whether or not the military in any respect um, engaged in any violation of the Com uh, Posse Comitatus Act and this separation yes. of authority and if so what what have been your findings if you would yes I and, and many of my my colleagues in the Defense Department have looked at this question very carefully. We have found absolutely no infraction of the Posse Comitatus Act. And indeed, our, our finding is that at all times, uh, the military support that was provided was completely in accordance with statute and the procedures laid out in the Department of Defense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bryant. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I might just add on to what Mr. Schiff, my colleague, said. As we have discovered, it is perhaps apparent that the Posse Comitatus Act was not violated here. But what, what was the problem was the fact that uh, the ATF, while they may have used the wrong method to get the uh, military there, the fact was they had to greatly overstate, exaggerate, perhaps even invent this idea that there was a methamphetamine lab on the premises to do that. So we're getting lost on whether posse comitatus applies or not and missing the clear point here that the ATF may have overstated their authority in their perhaps overzealousness to get their search warrant. I think that's the main point we want to remember here. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for being here today. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, uh, there's clear uh, testimony from Mr. Hubble that the military was, in, was involved in a meeting uh, with the Attorney General and several others uh, to give advice on the 14th of April, 1993. Uh, was there, were there other occasions the military was used to brief people in the White House, uh, perhaps even up to the President, in regards to this particular operation? Not to my knowledge. To your knowledge, the highest level then that would be involved would be the Attorney General? The, the two Army officers that, that, that briefed her, yes. And I understand she was briefed following the siege uh, and that would would that be uh, of course that's after the April 14th or that would be that would April, be April 14 was was the date at whose insistence and request was this well done? the request came from the Department of Justice and it was approved by the Department of Defense 
for these two Army officers to consult with her, yes. Okay. In reviewing the Department of Justice uh, report on this Waco incident, at page 267 of that report, it details this April 14, 1993 meeting indicating that the military personnel were present and uh, we were talking about gas and so forth. And in that, it mentions the military officials also said that a, in a military operation, uh, the entire compound would be gassed at once, not gradually. And I understand the military's role is much different than law enforcement. Here's, here's some points I want to make. Uh, the military officials, I'm sorry, however, the law enforcement interest was to go step by step. And I want to ask you, after I read all this, was this your understanding of the way the FBI intended this uh, uh, gas insertion to be. However, the law enforcement interest was to go step by step, increase the pressure, and make it increasingly uncomfortable inside the structure in an effort to drive them out. After discussing the nature of the gas and varied tolerance levels to be expected from the occupants, the meeting participants were prepared to wait two or three days for everyone eventually to come out. The action was viewed as a gradual step-by-step -step process. It was not law enforcement's intent that this be D-Day. Both the Attorney General and Director Sessions voiced concern for achieving the end result with maximum safety. Clark, who would be uh, uh, the FBI, made it clear that the goal of the plan was to introduce the tear gas one step at a time to avoid confusing the Branch Davidians and thereby maintain the impression that they were not trapped. Uh, was that, would that be your basic understanding through, through the military that were there as to what uh, the intent of the law enforcement side was? Well, I, I read the same report that you did, which is the report to the Deputy Attorney General from within, and I, met, I think that's a correct rendition, at least as I recall from reading it again this weekend. Um, but basically, um, I mean, I can only, uh, I can only uh, attest to what the military officers, uh, how they responded to the Attorney General on, on what they would do if it were a military operation, yeah. which is as, as I have indicated in my testimony today. And as the scenario developed uh, on April 19, 1993, it was a very different one than the one described to the Attorney General uh, on April 14, 1993. Is that correct? It did turn out a lot different than what they had. Uh, well, I mean, my, my only my my knowledge of that is the same as yours. I mean, just from watching television and reading public accounts of it. I mean, I have no insider knowledge of of, of how the FBI conducted the operation because basically uh, our people were not only our uh, military people that were in the vicinity uh, were there only in a training capacity and in fact were enjoined by the FBI from not, from not participating, not being in the area, not observing, just basically staying away while they conducted the operation as a law enforcement operation. Uh, my, my last question, you went a little long in the answer there, but was my last question would be, were there, was there any other role that uh, the military played in advising uh, in Washington after this April 14th, not at Waco, but in Washington after April 14th, 1993, this particular meeting? N not that I'm aware of, no. Thank you, Mr. Bastard. Thank you. Your time has expired. Uh, Mr. Heineman, Chief. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Getting back briefly, and you may have answered this, and I apologize for my redundancy if you have, but the support that ATF asked relative to that methamphetamine lab, um, was there participation in that from the DEA Yes, let, let me explain. Um, frequently, the questions directed to witnesses have indicated that this is sort of a direct ATF, JTF-6 request. But that isn't the way it happened. Basically, the, the, obviously, the request was generated by the ATF, and then it, it went into Operation Alliance, which was this committee, the clearinghouse of all the law enforcement agencies, of which the four principal permanent members senior members were, best of my knowledge, were uh, DEA, uh, Customs, Border Patrol, and ATF. And so that was, obviously, when they reviewed the request, uh, they did it collegially mm -hmm. within the Operational Alliance, and then they passed that request to the Joint, to joint Task Force 6. 
Okay. At this time, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Hyman. Uh, just a couple brief questions. Um, just uh, one follow-up, uh, Ambassador, relative to the, uh, the British military personnel that you mentioned. Do you have any reason why they were there? I don't, I don't really know, except that since there is a, a, a close relationship, uh, they train together and discuss things, I'm told, between the FBI, HRT, and the SAS. And since the SAS, I believe, in contrast to our military units, actually do participate, do have a quasi-law enforcement um, uh, authority in certain circumstances when they operate within, within the United Kingdom. Um, I mean, don't take this as factual. Uh, this is what I've been led to believe. And so there is an association there, and I think it was probably uh, a professional exchange that one of the professional changes that they have on a not infrequent basis. But Okay, thank you. I don't know exactly. Um, Ambassador, the, the meeting that took place uh, with the, uh, the general and the uh, colonel that was referred to before, and they met with uh, the Attorney General uh, Reno, um, <coughs> do you know who else was present at that meeting? And, uh, and you so, mean on, who, on the military side? Yeah, well, who, any, any side, who else was present that, you, that you're permitted to talk about? Yeah, I mean, I think, as I recall, I think we have a list here somewhere. But. Um, let's see. Well, it was Director Sessions, Deputy Director Floyd Clark, Special Agent Danny Colson, Special Agent Larry Post, Special Agent Dick Rogers. And then um, that was from the FBI, and then, of course, the Attorney General, Mr. Hubble, and two other unidentified individuals. And then on, on our side were the two Army officers I described, um, Dr. Salem, and a, another, a, a fourth DOD person, who, a person who was an Army officer who was basically there as a, who did not participate in consultations. He was there as a, as a liaison officer from, uh, from the Department of the Okay, and, and as you testified, the CS gas was something that was talked about at that particular meeting, is that correct? Oh, yes. And uh, in addition to that, the military uh, personnel indicated, uh, did they not, that one thing that they didn't particularly care about, about the plan that was being proposed, was the military would have done it differently because they would have come in from all different sides uh, very quickly rather than yeah. to drag this thing out they, over 48 hours, correct? Well, they were asked um, what, uh, what they thought, and they out said... Of time, but isn't that yeah. correct? Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, as I, as and I said... And once the firing started, isn't that basically... I'm sorry? Once the firing from the Davidians from the inside occurred, isn't that pretty much what happened, that, that they started coming from all sides and pumping gas I, in I rather honest, than over a 48-hour period know. very quickly? I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, we, we, we were not there on the scene, and everything I would, I would say on that is hearsay. I mean, I have no direct knowledge of what happened. I see I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ambassador. Thank you very much for your testimony. I would just make a statement uh, before I yield back to the Chairman that uh, I'm somewhat concerned about hearing that even without a drug connection, uh, domestic law enforcement is able to access tanks, Bradley fighting vehicles, helicopters, training. Uh, is, that, is that accurate? Even without a, a drug connection, yes, as that, it was in this case, you're saying that that is accurate. Domestic law enforcement could access all of yeah. this. I think that's all according uh, to statute. I think this is an area of the law that perhaps uh, this committee and other committees of jurisdiction could uh, take a hard look at uh, following these hearings. And with that, I'll yield back my time to Chairman Zeliff. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, you, you indicated, uh, uh, and I think I asked you the question. I just want to be clear: uh, the drug czar has responsibility for the nation's drug war. Uh, at any time, did he get involved with the use of the drug czar's funds? Uh, well, who, who do you mean by the drug czar? Uh, Dr. Brown. Well, yes, Dr. Brown, head of the ONDCP, who does right. report to the president. He is the president's designated representative. Right. And uh, he, he certainly has an important responsibility. Did he get invited and, to the meeting? And, 
No. So I mean, his responsibilities generally revolve around uh, policy, the President's overall policy, uh, PDD-14, as well as, as looking at the overall national budget. And so we do submit our right. various budgets but to he's him a for budget review. Of some $14 billion. And, mm -hmm. uh, That's about it. But he has no, nobody contacted him relative to the use of, for example, something as big as Waco, where military operations resources were used. He had well, no influence whatsoever. I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't believe so. I don't, I'm not even sure uh, that whether he was appointed at that time. But I, but in any event, uh, I, I do not believe that anybody in that office Would it be possible? Uh, was consulted. I, I vaguely remember some correspondence somewhere, I, I'm not sure though, and I want to be very careful, that, that went to the, the office of, of uh, the drug czar. Uh, could you check to see if in fact... Be uh, glad to check. Uh, he was involved in the loop and if in fact they notified you and brought the military in before it went to JTF? Um, I can answer... Uh, uh, I. First of all, yes, we will I mean, check. I'd be happy we, to have we, you just check it. We, we will check. But it's, first of all, uh, the, de the Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, Drug Support, for the Drug Program and Support in the Defense Department, uh, did receive, I know that, did receive um, an information copy of the uh, execute order that was signed off on by the general in charge of Joint Task Force 6. And so, uh, yes, there was that connection with the policy office in the Office of Secretary of Defense. So I was not on board at that point. That, but I, that's called an information copy? Information copy, so yes. So that they were notified and I guess brought into the loop by getting a copy of a piece of paper which told them Th that, that, that it this, was about to happen. Yes, that this operation. February 28th was the day of the original ATF raid. Did Texas Governor Richards consult with any military personnel on the 28th of February? Is this military, and, and would the military officer uh, be one of the two that attended the briefing with General, uh, General Reed, Attorney General Reno? Um, let, let me answer that in two parts. These were, were two uh, totally separate uh, occasions. Uh, the, the, the officer um, who was asked by General Taylor, who was the third corps commander at Fort Hood, uh, to respond to, to uh, uh, Governor Richard's request to talk with a knowledgeable military officer about the ATF incident that evening was uh, the as assistant division commander of the 1st Cavalry Division at Fort Hood. And that, that officer uh, did go and uh, talk with her that evening, uh, answering questions about uh, about the, the kind of material that had been used, the kind of material that might be uh, subsequently uh, requested. Um, and she asked him uh, to please uh, also uh, consult with the adjutant general who was relatively new on the job, as I'm told. Thank you. I think my time has expired. Mr. Micah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <sighs> Mr. Holmes, you are the Assistant uh, Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and in Low-Intensity Conflict, right? That's correct. Are you familiar with this uh, document, the United States Department of Justice? And this is the briefing book that was uh, provided to the Attorney General on April 12th. You somewhat familiar with this document? Is, is this is this the report, the after action report? No, this is no. April twelfth, uh, no, nineteen ninety three. I'm not familiar with that document. Uh, in it, it says, uh, and let me read from page forty. It says, experience with the effects of CS gas on children, including infants, has been extensively investigated. Are you familiar with this information uh, being given to the attorney general? No, I'm not. You are not. Uh, did you realize that uh, this information was uh, given by Dr. Salem 
to the Attorney General in the briefing? No, I was not aware of that. Mm -hmm. Now, again, you're in the military, but can you tell me any incident in the history of the United States where, the, where we have used CS gas and use of the military in some fashion in a civilian law enforcement incident where there have been children present in a confined area? I'm not aware of any such incident. Now, you've also heard my colleagues here testify, or, or comment, not testify, <laughs> my comments testify that the CS gas has dissipated uh, in the bodies. Are you uh, aware uh, of the Department of Justice October 8th report? Uh, this is afterwards, not a mm -hmm. briefing paper in advance, but afterwards. Page 312, it says, it is impossible to know how many of the persons inside the compound inhaled the tear gas because the last gas insertion ended nearly an hour before the fire ended. That lapse of time could have been sufficient for the CS gas to have dissipated from any of the bodies in which it might have been present earlier. This is uh, from that report. Are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, does, is Dr. Salem, was Dr. Salem consulting to, was he a military individual? He works in the Department of Defense as a civilian employee? He's a, a civilian scientist. Who, but within the Department of he's Defense. He's a defense, yeah. I believe he is a Department of Defense uh, employee. employee. And yeah. was anyone outside of the military or a Defa Department of Defense employee consulted on the use of ex of CSS, CS gas uh, where children are in a by, confined by, space. Consulted by whom? By the Attorney General, by anyone that you I don't know. I, you, I, I, I don't know. Uh -huh. If the military were to use uh, CS gas on where there are children and infant uh, present, would he be the only one that would be consulted? Well, uh, that, I, 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 don't, I, I think that's within a the military situation. I, uh, I, I, I wouldn't envisage the military uh, in, in being involved in, in a law enforcement situation where children would be involved. Do you think that we should have a change in our policy, given the facts that are now present? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we had a panel sit right at that same table. Half of them said mm -hmm. some of them may have died from uh, CS gas. Others said that uh, they didn't. Uh, but we're in a civilian situation where the military is giving advice and counsel, even with a civilian defense employee, do you think we should have a, a different policy or look at it, our policy where we have uh, children and infants uh, present? To well, I don't, I don't really have an opinion uh, w with respect to civilian law enforcement in that respect. Um, the only the only thing I could comment on is what has already been brought out in this hearing is to what is to uh, the familiarity that that uh, many of our military personnel have with the use of, of CS gas in training. I think my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Lofgren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have uh, one question. I think you've really answered everything in some cases more than once. Um, in the um, report from uh, Edward Dennis in the Department of Justice on the whole uh, Waco incident, he has recommendations. I don't know if you've had a chance to read the report. I have not. But the last recommendation that he has is to evaluate funding for the development of a chemical means to render individuals unconscious for a period of time without warning. And obviously, I could imagine as a non-law enforcement, non-military person, the utility of such a gas as composed of what we uh, currently have available. And I was just wondering, I don't want you to get into anything that could be a national security issue, but uh, whether there might be some potential in the R&D stage for, you think, for the Defense Department and civilians to really develop this kind of means, or whether you think that that is really beyond the realm of possibility. I don't really have an opinion on that. All right, fair enough. And I would like to yield the balance of my time to my colleague, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. I want to thank the uh, gentlelady from California and um, 
I probably would say the same thing that she said, is that you may have answered these uh, time infinitum, but I, again, um, am reminded of the lives that are lost and the seriousness of which, let me say to you that I appreciate the seriousness of which you have answered the questions, uh, no matter how they have seemingly been pointed, um, that you've been fair in your response. Uh, the um, question that I'd like to pursue again, maybe, um, is to the overlays of decision makers. Because I keep hearing um, maybe suggestions that there was a frivolous process and that the military may have come either uninvited or without basis of coming and that their involvement was extremely extensive. And that's why I tried to draw out utilization of military and the tragedy of Oklahoma City and then the great loss of life and, and devastation of Hurricane Andrew, so that American people can understand many occasions where the military might be present involved in a domestic uh, situation. I have, um, it's been brought can to I, my attention. Can I? Uh, Go right you, ahead, yes. Let me res respond to that. And I think it is important for the American people to understand the extent of, of uh, military help to communities throughout our country. Uh, just as this is a, a rough statistic, but, but last year, 1994, uh, the, the Department of the Army tells me there may have been as many as 7,000 requests for help from military uh, uh, bases and, and installations uh, up and down the land that, that range across the full, you know, floods, firefighting, helping with incidents and in communities. Coming uh, from the civilian population. Coming from the, yeah, mil military support to civilian communities. So it is extensive. And it is, it, it is, it has long been practiced. And uh, judging from the letters we receive, uh, it is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Let me move now to the Waco situation. There was now the, the calling out, the pulling out of Dr. Brown's name as the drug czar and making this even more potentially a clandestine operation than what, what one would might think. And <clears throat> I, I want to at least try to, this is the first time I've heard his name even being called up. And I, I, if I can just interrupt yeah. this for a second, I'll give you some extra time. Uh, I, I, I would like to correct, uh, I, was, I was in error when I said Dr. Brown, it should have been uh, Mr. Martinez, uh, who was, but, but what I was referring to was, was the drug czar's office informed, no matter who it was, but I was incorrect in using Dr. Brown when you had asked me who. Uh, I, I didn't realize at that point. Yeah, that I didn't think he was Mr. on board at that point. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm just trying to determine that. I appreciate your clarification. But then let me move quickly to the layers of decision making. It's my understanding you keep saying alliance. I'd like, uh, as I leave you time to answer this question, uh, you in mentioned alliance. Name some of the uh, law enforcement so we can understand just what you're talking about and. Uh, then answer this question, isn't it true that the DA might have been part of evaluating the evidence of a drug nexus presented by the ATF to Operation Alliance, primarily because yeah. they were involved in it? And then is it your understanding that the DA felt that there was a sufficient nexus to warrant military assistance? Again, you may speculate, but they were part of the alliance. And if you can answer those questions, I would appreciate well, I, it. Bearing in mind the idea yeah. is were there more decision makers than just uh, a possible yeah, ATF, I, I can only... no matter how wrong or right it might have been? I can only tell you that the request came to Joint Task Force 6 from Operation Alliance, but I, but, uh, and I those, do and know name those groups. that the senior members who participate in these discussions uh, are DEA, Customs, Border Patrol, ATF, and others. All right. I mean, there, there are many law enforcement agencies uh, in at the national level and local, state, that, that participate in this process. So, so, so it's it a collegial decision, they discuss it, and then they pass on. We, we get several hundred of those a year that, that come to the Joint Task Force 6. Thank you very much. Hmm. Chairman, thank you. Hmm. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and, uh, Ambassador, I, I would just, I would like to say that, that uh, we appreciate you coming back. Uh, I know this is the second time. Um, and, and some of these may have been repetitious, but we wanted to make sure, and we have all the facts uh, before we move forward. Uh, this concludes the, the ninth day of our joint subcommittee uh, hearings. Uh, tomorrow morning we will reconvene at uh, 10 a.m. And uh, 
We now stand recessed until 10 tomorrow morning. This concludes the ninth day of House Waco hearings. Tomorrow, see day 10, the final day of hearings. You'll hear testimony from Attorney General Janet Reno for nearly eight hours. Tomorrow's hearings will begin at 10 a.m. and run until about 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Tonight on C-SPAN, War in the Pacific. This week, we mark the 50th anniversary of VJ Day with a series of...